for this week's challenge Wednesday, we have Genuine, and Genuine is seven months status post right ACL reconstruction with a desire to return to full speed running. The patient appears to have good knee extensor strength during a routine manual muscle test. The most accurate rationale for isokinetic testing is, so we have A, a valid measure for comparing the quadriceps cross-sectional area between the injured and non-injured leg. B, the ability to measure quadriceps force production at patient selected speeds. C, the ability to measure quadriceps and hamstring force production at a velocity greater than 60 degrees per second. And D, the ability to measure external force production at a constant angular uh, velocity. All right, so there you go. Those answer choices have a lot, a lot in them. And so we'll make sure we go back over it for those of you who are in the gym or on the, in the car. Uh, but let's go up to the top of this one. So we have Genuine is seven months status post right ACL reconstruction. I'll go ahead and stop there for a moment. Um, so we have this patient and the ACL reconstruction is one of the most common surgeries to show up in your first six months of practice, especially if you're orthopedic. So I expect this topic to show up on your MPTE. Maybe it's once, maybe it's three times, four times. I don't know a hundred percent how many times it will, but I will tell you it is very, very common. So you should know, uh, you know, why someone gets an ACL reconstruction, the different procedure protocol for walking a patient through their recovery phases. You should have an idea of all the interventions and why you do them and so forth. And this particular patient is seven months status pose. So we know that they're out in the more return to function phase, all right, of their protocol right now. All right, and now it says that the patient has this desire to return to full speed running. But we know when we're training patients with an ACL reconstruction, they can't just start running whenever they wanna run, you know, as far as getting back to full speed running. Why? Well, that potentially will place a lot of stress on the ACL and potentially cause um, an issue with another rupture, right? And so we don't want that. But also full speed running, does it not put a patient at risk for things like falls? So we don't want the ACL to still be going through its earlier healing phases, the patient falls, and then they rupture the ACL again because of the fall, all right? So we gotta be very careful when we are making that determination like, okay, now you can return back to full speed running. And there's different things that we use in order to say, yes, my patient is ready, all right? And so these are just some things to keep in mind as we go through the question. Now it says the patient appears to have good knee extensor strength during a routine manual muscle test. Okay, well, the one thing that we know about good knee extensor strength here is that we're talking about what particular muscle group? Should be saying quads, right? And it's great, the patient has good knee extensor strength, but we know that I'm testing that through manual muscle tests. Now, what is one of the downsides, the cons to manual muscle testing? I mean, when we really look at it, manual muscle testing isn't the most reliable method, all right? Especially when we're looking at trying to assess whether a person's ready to return back to full speed running. Just because we're checking the patient with our manual muscle testing for knee extension and the patient seems strong, that doesn't actually mean that they're able to just get up and start running at full speed just because they can break you. And of course, the one thing that we got to think about as well is there's different testers, am I right? And so there's going to be uh, therapists that are weaker than others. And so the patient may seem that they're a five out of five, but truly their knee extensors are still significantly weak. So we gotta be very careful about the judgments that we make just based upon manual muscle testing. Does that make sense? Are we all good with that? All right, so the, the last sentence of this question says, the most accurate rationale for isokinetic testing is, and then we come down to our answer choices. So before I go through the answer choices, I just want to make sense of this last part of the question, the question stem. 
the most accurate rationale for isokinetic testing. Well, one thing about an ACL reconstruction, when we're returning our patient back to the, their sport, isokinetic testing is a more reliable, accurate way of determining somebody's likelihood of having another injury. All right, it gives us a really good accurate reading as to how much force the patient's able to put out, like how strong they are in a sense. So I like the fact that this is saying that for this patient, we're not just gonna rely on manual muscle testing, we're actually gonna go to the level of isokinetic testing. That makes sense to me. But the question's really asking you, why are we gonna do isokinetic testing? Like what is the accurate rationale or the best rationale for that? So for those of you on the podcast, let me go through the answer choices again. We have A, is a valid measure for comparing the quadriceps cross-sectional area between the injured and non-injured leg. B, is the ability to measure quadriceps force production at patient selected speeds. C, is the ability to measure quadriceps and hamstring force production at a velocity greater than 60 degrees per second. And D, is the ability to measure external force production at a constant angular velocity. So let's break these down by one by one. So A was a valid measure for comparing the quadriceps cross-sectional area between the injured and non-injured leg. And so when we're talking about that cross-sectional area, we're really talking about that the, the density of the muscle tissue. And in order for us to really figure that out, we need to be able to figure out what the mass is, the actual mass of that muscle. Um, and then divide that by the volume of the muscle. And that's not something that we're able to do with the isokinetic machine. I mean, I'm not sure how familiar that you are with the isokinetic device, but we really need to be familiar with that. It's also called the Biodex, all right? And this machine is responsible for keeping the speed the same, all right? Keeping the speed the same but it has variable resistance, meaning that, that we set the speed as the clinician, we're gonna set the speed of this machine, all right? And we're gonna set it at a certain you know, velocity, angular velocity, and now the patient is gonna move through the range against the resistance. Now, if the patient pushes with a lot of force, well, guess what? The Biodex machine is gonna increase its amount of force in order to make sure that the patient stays at the same speed. That's what isokinetic devices do. They keep the patient at the same speed and the device actually will match the patient's amount of force that they're putting in. All right, that's, that's what an isokinetic device is. That's what isokinetic testing is related to this question. Now, when I look at A, you know, does the isokinetic device assess for cross-sectional area? Does it tell me, you know, the density of the muscle? No. Does it compare the density between the non-injured and injured leg? Absolutely not. So I would say isokinetic testing is not a valid measure for comparing the quadriceps cross-sectional area between the injured and non-injured leg. Absolutely not. I'm going to put an X next to that one. Let's go ahead down to B. B says the ability to measure quadriceps force production at patient selected speeds. See, here's the thing. Like I was telling you before, isokinetic testing is keeping the patient at the same speed. The patient doesn't get to determine what speed it goes at. All right, that wouldn't be isokinetic testing. So it, it's not like the patient sitting on this device and they're kicking, you know, using their quads, kicking into the extension, and the patient is determining what speed they go at. No, the machine has already ha set at a certain speed, and it's the machine's goal to make sure that the patient stays at that speed. All right. And so this answer can't be correct because the patient doesn't select the speed. A lot of people selected B, as in Bravo, they selected this answer, and I, I get it because it's talking about a, a selected speed, and we hear that all the time with isokinetic testing, but it's not patient-selected speeds, all right? So let's go ahead and put an X next to that one. Let's go with C. C says the ability to measure quadriceps and hamstring 
force production at a velocity greater than 60 degrees per second, which is a very enticing answer. It's attractive because isn't it keeping me, you know, it seems at a certain velocity, angular velocity, it says 60 degrees per second. And then it's measuring the quadriceps and hamstring force. All that sounds right. But here's the deal. Notice how it says at, an, at a velocity greater than 60 degrees per second. That's not true because I can also use the isokinetic device at 30 degrees per second or 20 degrees per second, 10 degrees per second. I can even do it at zero degrees per second, which is known as an isometric uh, testing. All right. So the one thing about the isokinetic device and isokinetic assessment is I can assess concentric. I can assess eccentric activity. I can also ass assess isometric. And so this answer, I don't like it. And the reason why is, I don't know why it says greater than 60 degrees per second when it could easily be at 10 degrees per second. This is not true. I'm gonna go ahead and put an X next to that one, but we're not done yet. We're at D right now, but we don't know. We have to make sure that this answer is confirmed. So D says the ability to measure external force production at a constant angular velocity. Let me read that again. The ability to measure external force production at a constant angular velocity. You know, I, li I like this answer. And the reason why is it says constant angular velocity. Well, I know as a clinician, when I set my patient up on that biodex device, I set the speed that the patient will go at. I set that up before they even start, right? And so it keeps them at that constant angular velocity throughout when I'm testing. All right, so I like that part of the answer. The other part says the ability to measure external force production. That might have thrown some of you all off, but here's the deal. I told you that the Biodex device is going to match the amount of force that the patient is putting in in order to keep them at the same speed. So if you start to push with all your might, use a bunch of your force to push, it doesn't really matter because the machine is going to increase its resistance to match you to make sure that you go at the same speed. Same thing is, you know, if you decrease your amount of force and you were going really light on the machine, well, the machine is now going to decrease its resistance in order to match your lighter force. Does that make sense? I mean, that's a huge concept right there. And so, yes, the machine measures the external force production, which is equal to the internal force production anyway. All right. And so this is a perfect answer here. The ability to measure external force production at a constant angular velocity. The answer is D as in David. Congratulations to those of you who got this one correct. I know isokinetic device and dynamometry. This is one of those topics that not all of us were really exposed to in PT school. I know we had a biodex device in the back corner, this big bulky, uh, bulky expensive pieces, <laughs> piece of equipment, uh, but not everybody has had an opportunity to sit on it, move through it and, and see how it's used and all that stuff. And so it's really important that for this, you know, this particular concept here, that you spend a little bit of time maybe on YouTube or online, just going through the procedure and seeing how it's used. Because sometimes you can get a question that's asking you more about the procedure. And if you don't know who's setting the speed, when do you set the speed? That could be the reason why you get the question wrong. All right. And so I don't want that to happen to you. And I never want to just leave you with that. What I want to do is take you to the next level. If you're on the podcast right now, guess what your boy got for you? <laughs> guess what your coach got for you? I got a cheat sheet that's going to walk you through a lot of the isokinetic device information that you need to know for the exam. And I added some examples of different types of isokinetic exercises just to add the cherry on top of the ice cream cake, whatever you like. All right, so go in there to the show notes, click a link in there and get it 